First of all, uh, I've been working on serrated tussock since about 2000. Um, although I did have a break in the middle and started doing some other work in grazing systems and a whole heap of other stuff. But we've come back to our serrated tussock work after really our learnings out of that grazing systems work. And I think to be successful with serrated tussock management, you have to work at the whole farm level and you have to be profitable. Because if you don't have the money coming in, then you can't do the work that's needed to control the tussock. So it's, it's, it's all interlinked and you can't just focus on the tussock problem on its own. So today what I'm gonna talk about is, is those whole farm strategies and how you can look at, uh, link it all together and what are some of the big drivers in, in that at a whole farm profitability level. Uh, we've been working on this for about the last 18 months. It's a pilot project, so some of the modelling work we've done here hasn't been done before. So it's, it's uh, while it'll, it might look quite simple what we put up, um, it's actually sort of uh, a new way of using the models, uh, modelling. Uh, and and uh, don't be uh, disturbed when I say we're modelling farming systems because it's all based on uh, the, the interactions that actually happen on a farm and I've got the underlying data which I'll present today which show you the, the how, which, which actually drive these models. And so um, Jeff Miller is, is the guy who has who's done a lot of this work, he's based over at Orridge uh, and I've been working with uh, Carl Berrant who's an economist with CSU and Aaron who's going to present another part of this work um, later this afternoon. So when we were starting this work, it's, it's, this has been uh, a question that has been bugging us for a long time and it's been bugging me since I did this first, my first bit of Sarai Tussock work. How does the amount and composition of impartia influence the management of Sarai Tussock? So we know that ground cover and we know that pastures have value in, in limiting Sarai Tussock invasion, but we have no idea of the financials behind that. I mean, how much is it worth to you? How much focus should you be putting on that and how much should you be putting on other things? So this was really where we were coming from when we started developing this project. So um, just some of the background. So I'll just pick up that point about um, a serrated tussock being from Argentina and, and, and being an unpalatable plant there. When uh, I've actually been to Argentina and I've worked with an Argentinian scientist who works on those suite of grasses in Argentina. While serrated tussock is a minor species, there's a whole family of species uh, of the nacella species in Argentina that behave exactly the same way that serrated tussock does here. They're highly invasive, they cause the same production losses, it's just that's their native pasture. So they've got a bit of a different attitude to it. It's, it's been there, it's always there, so they don't, it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not legislated against, but it is causing the same production issues. Uh, it's just a bigger family of grasses they're doing rather than one, uh, one or two species. So the problem is the same, even in the home environment where it comes from. The same issues there, they actually find that the native vegetation there, when there's grazing is removed is actually more competitive. So if you leave a paddock ungrazed for 10, uh, 20 years, you'll start, they actually start to see the revert back to the more palatable species. But obviously we're in a farming system, we can't remove grazing for, for that period of time and we don't have the same species here. So uh, I know when I did my work, I had some nice kangaroo grass like this growing up like this in, in some non-grazed paddocks right next to serrated tussock plants, surrounding serrated tussock plants. I could get it to reduce the size of those plants, but you would never kill those adult plants no matter how much competition was around them. And uh, over, I think it was about two and a half years of monitoring plant, hundreds and hundreds of plants across the site, I never saw an adult plant die of natural causes. So they are very hardy uh, and it means that where our focus is, is if we want adult plants to die, we have to do it ourselves. Um, and we, if we're looking at preventive management, by the time we start seeing them as adults, we've lost the battle. Um, so, uh, and that's sort of where I'm coming from today. So, um, I, I'm mainly going to be talking about non-arable native pastures because this is the area that is most of a problem. If we have flats that are arable, we already have an integrated system that works. We know that we can spray out the, the tussock 
we can have a couple of years of cropping uh, to reduce the seed bank. We know we can sow a filarious based pasture and come across and control any serotusic seedlings with a herbicide and it works and it's productive. So you can actually do that in a productive way. Once you move into non-arable hill country, we don't have that same integrated weed management system for non-arable uh, native country. And part of the problem is our herbicides here target some of our native species. So you've already heard this today, but, uh, as, uh, but wallaby grass and microlina are two of our most productive native species and they are very susceptible to flupropanate. Um, to, there are some other species that are a bit resistant. Kangaroo grass shows some resistance, as does red grass. So if you've got a dominance of those in your pasture, then you actually might have a few more options. But uh, once you start moving off into this acidic country, or you've had any history of high grazing pressure, then these are the two species that you'll have in your pasture, and you won't have the red grass, and you won't have the kangaroo grass in them. So we really need to start taking a proactive approach to, uh, because once we're there, we're, we're, we're actually, we're in a much worse situation than, than before it invades. So uh, the weakest part of the serrated tussock plant's life cycle is the seedling. So this is the, 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 the time that we really should be trying to target uh, the plant. And this is where plant competition is, is targeting. So most of our seedlings, the bulk of the seedlings germinate through that autumn period. So what we find is it's from the first rains from about February onwards, the seedlings that germinate on those rains are the ones that survive and, and carry through that. Um, but what we find is most of those seedlings die the first summer. That, that moisture stress that comes in um, over that first summer period is when we lose it. So we're talking here thousands of seedlings often per square metre. They're, they're like hairs on a cat's back. Um, they can come up, but we, we lose most of those. So we've got huge seed numbers in the soil, lots of germination, but we only need a few of those to survive um, uh, and before we, um, uh, for us to actually start having reasonable levels of infestations building up. So seedlings that survive over the first uh, summer have generally experienced minimal competition um, so this photo down the bottom here, this is a 50 cent piece, uh, might not come up too clearly, but that's uh, tussock, uh, tussock seedling there. This is one that we sort of monitored through, so we know it germinated 12 months before. So this is in the second autumn period, there's the one next door which is uh, a little bit smaller, but, but in the same. So this is in lighter country, it, this work was done at Trunky Creek, um, sort of in that Abercrombie region, so, so it's not on good basalt soil, it's on lighter soil, but, but typical of what you find in, in native pastures in this region. Um, so often what we, by the time you see them, they're already established. So by the time we start picking up, Phil? Yeah. So just to get a bit of perspective, <coughs> if you're on your four wheeler, would you be able to find, would you be able to recognise a seedling that's one year old? Uh, you struggle. So, so you've got to be directly focusing on looking for it, I think. So if you're looking for one that's three weeks old, you don't see it because it looks like every other, the green haze that's underneath. So the ones we see, what do you think are eight or ten months old? Or? But yet, from the work that I did, we followed them from when they first emerged, so from, from one leaf, and by the time they reached that size, in this country, they were 12 months old. So a year old, isn't it? Yep. So, and by the time they reached that old, they really didn't die very often. <laughs> so so they, they had a much higher chance of... Yeah. Yep. Definitely, I think. So the plant that's there is probably excluding some already. Yep. Um, and then you are probably also controlling some seedlings that are sitting there that might be restricted by that plant and they haven't actually had a chance to come through. So this is just uh, from some of the research we did here. This is um, uh, just some seedling numbers. So I haven't looked at the fate of where these seedlings, this is just the total um, of seedlings on a seasonal basis. Um, and this bottom row here, what LSD means is, is least significant difference. So when the difference between these is greater than this amount, it's a significant difference. It's just a statistical thing, uh, which I have to abide by as a scientist. <laughs> so. what's, what's 
Okay, so this is where we uh, applied 50,000 serrated tussock seeds per square metre. So from, from this paddock, this is where the areas where there was tussock, we collected uh, a square metre of seed and that's how much seed was in that square metre. And we, so we doubled the seed in, 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 these, in these plots essentially that was going in in that year. These ones here had no treatment. These ones here we sprayed with two litres of food propionate. So first spring, all's good. We've, we've really impacted on our serotasic seedlings, although there's still some there. Uh, no treatment, had, had some seedlings, and our seed dish had had more. So as I mentioned, when we, when we go into that first summer period, we, we have, a, have a dramatic decrease in, in the number of seedlings. So we've got no difference between either of those treatments by the time we come to that first summer. When we come into the, the next autumn period, we again have no significant difference at this point, even though there's starting to be a trend developing up here. By the time we get into winter, so this is only 12 months after we've sprayed that flupropanane, a bit over 12 months after we sprayed that flupropanane, the seedling numbers here are well over double if we hadn't have sprayed that tussock. So while we've killed all the adult plants, we've stimulated an environment that is very, uh, uh, very nice for seedlings to start, to start germinating and surviving. And so what we found then from this point on, these, this treatment um, actually maintained higher seed numbers, uh, seedling numbers. And we went back and visited this 12 months later, that same trend, the only thing that was, that was significant across all the other treatments was herbicide and everything else in that trial had, had lower seedling numbers. So while we, our herbicide is really important for, for, for targeting our adult plants, we need to do it in as targeted a way as we can because all, the more collateral damage we do, the more we're setting up an environment for high rates of reinvasion. Uh, yes? No, what we think has happened is, is uh, a lot of these, so uh, these ones here, when we look 12 months later, we actually had slightly more than, than these seedlings here. So uh, the, we, we were maintaining, a, and, and what we did the next year after this was we actually looked at the size of it. So, so we actually followed the individual size classes through. So these were surviving, and what we felt was that the, so uh, the, the flu... So there, was there one treatment or two treatments? Well, no, this is just one, uh, um, one, spray. one spray back here uh, prior to these first measurements. So back in, in obviously it was winter or... <laughs> yeah. That, that's a two litre. So, so we did this experiment to represent what was currently on the, la at the, on the label at that time. So you residual? Yes, but, but we think that that residual was being leached down uh, because there was enough rain um, and that, so the seedling root development, they were always able to keep those, seed, those uh, roots uh, above that, that, that flupropanate layer as it sort of leached down. That's, that's what we think is happening. We don't have any, uh, I suppose, uh, evidence to, to support that, but that's what I think has happened. So yeah, so, so that, that's what we think. Yeah, that's what we think has happened, but I, 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 can't, I can't substantiate that because we don't exactly know, but it's, it's, a, it's a logical conclusion from this work. Well, it, it can last for up to a couple of years, but, but it depends a lot on how much it's leached and, and, and where does that go. So you're obviously getting some movement and, and it's moving through that topsoil. So, um, next thing I'm just putting up is, uh, again, what we've got here is, is two different grazing treatments. So uh, this is just over that second year period um, here. And the two grazing treatments, uh, one is, is was really centered around a cell grazing treatment, but um, I think the most important thing to note is it had higher biomass, um, it, so the pasture was more competitive. It was the same annual stocking rate, just the grazing management allowed that pasture to be much more competitive. Uh, and so that's called the active grazing treatment here. 
And this was a con uh, con constant grazing or continuous grazing treatment here. Again, we've got the, the, the nil seed treatment and the seed plus treatment. So this is the year after we've added that seed. You can see that we start in autumn with lower levels with that active grazing. So I've had more competition limiting those seedlings. And by the time, because we've got fewer there and we've got more dropping off, we're actually, we, we didn't have any survive uh, in this treatment over that first summer period. So that, that competitive pasture was actually able to limit the serratosic. So, uh, and not, not make it through that first summer. Where with the continuous grazing, um, and so this is without, in the absence of, of, of spraying with herbicide. We had higher levels of, of seed germinate here in autumn. Those levels sort of maintained in the spring and in summer here, um, uh, we still had some remaining. So we're getting some, some build up of seedlings there. So what's driving it? Um, this graph here, again, just throwing those three seasons. And this is the relationship between uh, serrated tussock number along here, so that's all you need to know. Uh, and this is the total herbage mass, so the total mass of pasture. This is the bare ground. So we start with zero here, up to 60% bare ground is, is the maximum levels that we found there. And the bottom one is the interesting one. This is the perennial dry matter. So how much perennial grass was part of that dry matter? So what we found was relatively nice relationships through autumn, winter and spring with the level of dry matter and the level of cover. So once we got to about two tonnes of dry matter, which is about in native pastures, probably about that much on the ground, as in height, um, we, we found that the seedlings weren't able to, uh, weren't able to survive um, in, or, or germinate and, and, and establish in those areas. So similarly with bare ground, you need to be really at 100% bare ground to actually limit that, that, that invasion. But once we got here to summer, there was really not much relationship between those factors and, and the, the seedlings that survived. What, so, what was really driving this was the amount of perennial grass. So if you had perennial grass there through that summer period, then that is what was actually stopping the, uh, the seedlings from, from surviving. And it's almost, so we, we really only needed as little as about half a tonne of dr perennial dry matter per hectare. So just some perennial was enough to stop seedlings establishing there. Does one plant have a lifespan? I mean... Of serrated tussock? Uh, it's 20 plus years. So as I say, every, as I say, I monitored them for two and a half years and didn't see an adult one die. Uh, and anecdotal reports are it's, it's, it's 20 plus years, but no one has followed the plants individually to actually know exactly what that age is. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, so in this environment, the, the reason there, uh, that autumn measurement is we, we start to pick up numbers, but they're, they're not all germinating at once. They're germinating in waves that build up to a number about midwinter. We're, surprising to us, we actually found very few additional seedlings on the spring flush, but we think that that's because we actually had a bit more herbage mass there limiting them, them, them actually coming through. So it's, it's not that they can't, it's just that the conditions aren't as conducive for them to actually do that. Okay, so um, just to, to summarise some of that, two tonnes of dry matter prevented seedlings germinating. So this is one thing, if you're looking at, at a management criteria you can focus on, uh, maintaining areas at above two tonnes or 100% bare ground will actually stop those seedlings germinating. Um, and a high perennial density um, increase the tussock mortality. So perenniality is a real key. So you've got to have perennial pastures there. And interestingly, when we divided the, the, the looked at the survival rate over that summer um, in the perennial pastures compared to the annual pastures, about 0.3% of seedlings survived in the perennial pasture. Where in those annual dominant pastures, 18% of those seedlings survived that first summer. So it's a real crucial point. So that summer is a real, uh, it's a real point to focus with your management and perennials are the thing that, that actually stop seedlings there. You don't need a lot of them, but they need to be there. 
So this is the, the you've always got to put a classic pencil line comparison up when you do a serrated tussock torque, so here's mine. Uh, this is the paddock here that has, this has actually had no control over about 20 years. Uh, and it still isn't 100, so there's, there's two things I want to show here. This is still not 100% tussock, even after 20 years of being flogged and no control, because it actually has some perennial there that is, is preventing that, that going to 100% tussock. The other th side of the fence here is a relatively conservative managed place that had very little obvious signs of control. They were obviously doing some spot spraying work and that sort of thing, but you really didn't see very much tussock jumping over that fence. Um, and, and we were working at this site. I worked there for about three or four years. Aaron, you worked there for another few years after that, and it stayed the same through the whole time we were working there. So it's, it's, a, it's a good example. So um, the other issue I just wanted to raise before I sort of moved on to some of the modelling work we've done is it's impossible to manage a whole farm to prevent serrated tussock. So we know we always have areas of the paddock that have bare ground or um, we always have parts of the farm that we can't keep it. So these benchmarks that might be uh, uh, keeping our serrated tussock out. So there's always going to be a niche where um, our serrated tussock will establish. And so this is just some, some work we've done from a, another project that looked at uh, say different landscape classes. So here where we've got sort of some upper slope areas, you've got a lot more bare ground, lower lower herbage mass, so these might be more susceptible to, to serrated tussock invasion. And this is here is across um, a paddock. We've actually looked at the distribution of dry matter. And so if our target here is to keep a, and this is in two different seasons. So this is in autumn in a wet year, autumn in a dry year. And what you see here, this is the, the point we're trying to keep our, our germination out. So in the wet year, we've got about 25% of that paddock that is still susceptible to invasion, or to germination. So even really good year, we're just reducing the area of that paddock that's actually susceptible to germination. Uh, in a dry year, you actually, that's up to a 75% of the paddock that then starts to become susceptible. So you've got these, these, these spatial variation across the paddock and then you've also got variation between years based on how good the season's been. So uh, this is just looking at a, at a germination level rather than, than going through to, the, to looking at it from a survival point of view. So livestock production, when we start looking at this whole farm approach, livestock production is the main focus of commercial farms. So we have to link this in with our serrated tussock management. Uh, successful management of serrated tussock must consider the direct cost of control. So how much does it cost you to control this? The impact on livestock production. So you need to, to consider in how much lost production you're actually having from this weed being there. Um, and most importantly, you actually need a, a forward-looking approach, a proactive approach, and how much is the future invasion um, going to be costing you in the future? So it's fine if you do something this year, you might have a great result, but what is going to be the flow-on impact of that in the following years? Because there's no point in killing all your tussock in this year, um, but leaving a whole place that's going to be 100% tussock um, in a few years time because you've left the perfect conditions for it to re-establish. So, uh, and this is why we start looking at these integrated strategies and why we need integrated strategies. So to do, the only way we can do all this is, is actually in a modelling framework because it's too complex and takes too much time and to, to actually go and run all these scenarios in a field. Um, so the objectives of the work were to determine how stocking rate uh, and pasture management influence pasture dry matter and serrated tussock invasion, and to assess the whole farm economics, including those cost of control, losses in livestock production, and future invasion rates. So we used a model called Ausfarm model. I'm not going to talk about this in a lot of detail. This, so this is just one brief slide. Uh, we developed this model for uh, our Evergraze work, uh, which was a, a grazing experiment we ran for four and a half years, um, at 25 k south of Orange. Um, we have confidence that the model A accurately predicts livestock production. So this is just say some model weights versus some actual weights that, uh, f uh, that, uh, that came out of, from lambs um, run on this experiment. 
Um, and we also have confidence that it actually uh, relatively accurately predicts the dry matter as well. So there two things are important. So dry matter is important for ceratotoxic survival and the, um, the animal production is important for determining the profitability. So we're able to take these models that we developed and then build in a serratotusic invasion model. And this is sort of the, the new bit of work that hadn't been done with these models before. So this, just to show you what that landscape looked like, uh, this is actually our Evergrey site, uh, microlina wallaby grass dominant pasture, uh, relatively uh, undulating to, to a little bit hilly uh, and all uh, a native grass pasture. So what did we look at? We, we modelled a whole heap of things, but um, what I'm going to present today is two uh, climate scenarios. So what we're looking at here is, uh, so what we're doing is we're actually looking forward from this point using some downscale weather data. As we know, looking forward, there's a lot of variability in what our future weather might be. So what we're doing is we're taking uh, the weather data from Orange and looking into the future for uh, one that is a dry scenario and one that is a wet scenario. So this is the range of future climates we might uh, uh, get for this environment. <clears throat> we, we started with two pasture starting points. So 100% perennial pasture, which is essentially what was on that Evergrey site, and then a 50% annual and a 50% perennial. So what we've simulated there is that where we've, say, controlled um, serrated tussock across half that area with boom spraying, and then that annual pasture has regenerated um, and that's the current place we're seeing at. Still no tussock, but we've got a, a, an annual pasture sitting there that's, that's uh, more susceptible to invasion. Then we've run just two stocking rates, a 4 DSE per hectare and a 6 DSE per hectare. So this, we did run some higher ones, but we uh, started to really crash the system, so I'm not presenting those. And then we looked at five serrated tussock management options. First one was there's no serrated tussock, so this is so we can tell what the impact of having serrated tussock is. Uh, the next one is, is the no control option. So if we did nothing over uh, the 35 years of these runs, what happened? Then we looked at boom spraying only. So waiting till our serrated tussock got to a certain level and then we just ran the boom across it. Um, and so we do, we're doing that sort of say, on average, I think it was about it, four, uh, four to five year intervals uh, because a lot of people are, are sort of taking these type of approaches. Uh, a spot spraying only. So this is where we just spot sprayed and we spot sprayed uh, to, to everything that was there and then a boom and a spot spraying based on the density that was, that, that was there. So... You said a certain level, the The reason I've said a certain level is because it's a little bit complex to describe exactly what that is because it's based on the distribution of pasture but it is around, say, that, 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 um, that's a road task of getting you about 10% of the paddock area. So that's, that's it. I've, I've actually got some, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the road tussock areas uh, over time, which, which demonstrate how much it was. So what, what I'm showing you here is, this is just uh, what is the invasion rates of serrated tussock under some different scenarios. So this is the dry scenario here, and this is the wet scenario. So under a dry scenario, we're going to get more tussock than what we're going to get under a wet scenario. Uh, the other thing to note here is we've got the two stocking rates. So the six is the blue, which is a bit higher than the red, which is four. So again, that stocking rate influence, we're having, a, if we're running a higher stocking rate, we're having uh, less pasture there. So we're getting higher invasion rates of serrated tussock. And these are episodic, and this is based because some of this stuff's seasonal. You might go along for a lot of years. And the other important thing to note here is uh, we adjusted the stocking rate to the past area. So if we had half the paddock that was tussock, we were running half the number of animals that's keeping a 6 DSE on that, that pasture area. So we, because what we found, if we didn't do that, we sort of went off backwards really quickly by trying to maintain a stocking rate. And we figured this is what happens in practice because if people haven't got uh, food in a paddock, you're not going to put animals in there. <coughs> um, and the other really interesting thing here is uh, the difference here. So the solid lines, they are the 100% perennial and the dotted lines, they are the 50% annual, 50% perennial. So those annual pastures, really invade quite quickly, particularly at a high stocking rate. So 
if we're looking, this paddock is, is 40 hectares um, with 20 of that starting as annual, that's within about three years, that's fully invaded um, with tussock. So that annual pasture is really susceptible. You have these really high invasion rates um, and you get to those levels really quickly. Uh, where if you've, even at the same stocking rate, your perennials is, is much slower, that, that invasion. So you're actually slowing down that process, even when you're sort of grazing at a, high, at a heavier rate. So this is just looking at the serrated tussock levels with uh, different, uh, uh, different control options. And again, I've, I've just focused on the dry scenario here. And on this side of the graph, these are the perennial um, pasture options, and these are the ones that have the annual component. So as you can see, no control. Um, again, the, the perennials are uh, having a bit more impact on that. It happens very uh, more quickly under the, the um, uh, uh, annual scenarios. But what we see here with the boom spraying, we're sort of hitting a level and then we're, it's, it's going down. It's sort of hitting a level, it's going down. You sort of get to a point because those pastures revert from perennial to annual, then you start to get a higher rate of invasion back into those. So here, we're, and you might get a poor season, so you get a, a, something drop it, jumping up where you've got a fair bit that you actually have to control in that year. Um, and then, say the spot spraying options, all keep the tussock virtually at, at, at very low levels, which is sort of uh, where you want to be to, to maintain livestock production. So this is just showing the animal numbers. So what has been the impact on the animal numbers for these scenarios? So. Uh, Again, I've just picked the 4 DSE um, and dry scenario, um, and this is the, the annual pasture. So we just see the, this virtually directly mirrors um, what the, the opposite of the serrated tussock level. So we see the quick drop off in numbers and then levels out. With boom spraying, we're going up and down a bit. And I should say, we, we ran merino weathers uh, in this system just simply because it's a lot simpler to model than, than doing a, a breeding enterprise. So what are the financial outcomes of this? Um, so these graphs, what I'm looking at here is, I've called it cumulative profit, but what it is, is, is all the variable costs on the farm. So it's a sheep gross margin plus your cost of, of uh, serrated tussock control. So we've, we've just removed the fixed cost for a number of reasons. So here, when we're looking at our wet scenario, 4 DSE, 100% perennial pasture, we don't have a big impact of serrated tussock on our productivity because we're not getting a high so, so so this is no control here this orange line and everything else is is essentially keeping the same level of profitability as if we had no tussock when we look at that same scenario but with 50 percent annual this is the if we do nothing and and the impact on production from um, uh, from having serrated tussock and this is no tussock what we find is our spot spraying is actually uh, is, is, uh, not profitable in this area because our invasion rate is too high. So when we've got these annual areas that have previously been sprayed or we've got high areas that are degraded, if we, if we and I must say, we, we've costed uh, all our spot spraying time at $45 an hour. So it's, it's all contracted. So it's not saying that you, you, you're, you're doing it all yourself. We, we're, we actually costed it all. But here, the invasion rates are just too high. If you're just using spot spraying to keep it down, then you're worse off than, than, than the uh, production that you're losing. But if you're using either a combination of, of uh, boob spraying and spot spraying, which is this dark blue line, or boom spraying, then you're actually being able to stay on top of it. Uh, and, and you're losing a little bit of production, but you're not losing uh, a, a huge amount over that, over that period. So again, when we look at um, the, uh, the dry scenario, very similar trend. It's just there's, there's a bit more uh, spread than what we get with, uh, from the wet scenario and spot spraying does a lot worse down here. Um, so it, it's basically not economic to spot spray because it costs you too much time to go out and do it. So when we do that at six DSE, so those are all the four DSE, these are the six DSEs. Uh, and these uh, influences are, are only exacerbated further. So, so what we find here, this, uh, we still, everything still um, 
more profitable than, than doing nothing here at 6 DSE with 100% perennial in the wet scenario. Uh, but boom spraying really is not much different, but our spot spraying and our spot boom spraying, uh, we're only losing a little bit of production compared to uh, no tussock. Over here, um, it's our spot boom spraying does come out in the end as being more successful. Uh, but the boob spraying sort of ends, ends up about the same as, as, as no control. So we're just looking at loss production, but our spot spraying because of the time, again, it's, 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 it drops off. When we come down to the, uh, to the dry scenario, yeah, your spot spraying really crashes there. Um, and, and you're really only looking at your, your uh, spot boom spraying option that's, that's really successful here. Even the spot spraying is starting to drop because we're getting higher invasion rates. So any questions about that before I start to move on? I, I know it's, it's a little bit wordy. Um, it's a bit complex, but um, I'll, I'll summarise now in... in no, that's all countries that you can get about. Like this, this, we only have an option of spot spraying in the country. We don't do it early Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what, just for this ex uh, exercise, we, we've assumed that you can get across it with a boom for everything. The way that we would then factor in her, uh, helicopter costs, which we're going to do for this work, but we haven't done yet, is we'd take those same boom spraying areas because essentially it's the same process, but we'll just put in the, the cost for a chopper and that's going to change the economics of some of these scenarios quite a bit. Because a lot of your, uh, especially when you start to get it, both in, in uh, Gilead countries where it generally starts, you really can't get around with that. You don't use the spot spraying, you don't have any options. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is, <laughs> this is not saying that spot spraying is, is, is not the right option. What it's saying is once you sort of get to a really degraded pasture, your invasion rates are just so high that if you're fully costing the time of that spot spraying, it's, it's uneconomic. In those difficult areas, could you not do a control burn off or something? Is that, or do they, is that... I uh, have done some work with burning in the past. So burning doesn't kill Tussie. Um, it, it, all it does is actually simulate, it actually stimulates the germination of seedlings. So you, you don't actually lose any of the Okay, I'll just quickly go over some of that. Um, I've really talked about the first two points there. So just when you're looking at this on average, so I'll move here to point three, annual pastures have a higher invasion rate of serrated tussock than perennial native pastures. So we have a 40% higher invasion rate and that reduces the uh, profit uh, by 44% compared to perennial pastures. So focusing on maintaining perennial pastures is an absolute priority in serrated tussock management. Uh, higher stocking rates um, have higher invasion rates of serrated tussock than lower stocking rate. And we found with this work, the, the 6 DC compared to the 4 DC had about a 32% higher invasion rate. Uh, changes in, in rainfall patterns predicted with climate change will influence the future serrated tussock uh, invasion rates. So on average there was a 37% higher invasion rate in the dry compared to the wet scenario. Um, and this resulted in, in, in say 35% lower profitability in the dry compared to that, that wet climate scenario. But once we take serrated tussock out of the, 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 the picture, that's down to 14%. Sorry Phil? So, so that um, change in Uh, we think it's less about the, the timing of rain and more about the lower herbage mass. So this is, this is one scenario, same management compared to the, to the managed. So you've just got lower herbage mass with a drier scenario. I think it's that simple. Okay. It is a set stock rate, so it's a 4 DSE per hectare uh, per, per year, yeah, per annum. Yeah. So spot spraying was the most con, uh, uh, cost-effective control option in perennial pastures. So when you've got that perennial content there to actually reduce your invasion rates, we can stay on top of it with, uh, with perennial pastures and on average, uh, this is the, say the average of the spot spraying and the boom spot spraying combination, it only reduces the profitability of the system by, f by about 14% compared to if you had no tussock there. So, and that's at full, full contract rates for, for all spot spraying that was done. So if you stay on top of it, you can actually minimise the impact on your profitability when you've got a good pasture base there. 
But if you haven't got that good pasture base, then uh, evasion rates were too high to make spot spraying viable. So you just have too much tussock coming in and you can't stay on top of it with spot spraying alone. But in that environment, we can use a spot boom spraying option. So that's boom spraying the heavy areas, spot spraying, sort of doing some clean up jobs around it. Um, and that was successful in keeping the serrated tussock out. Uh, it reduced the profitability by about 30% compared to if you had no serrated tussock there. So it's still a big hit to your bottom line if you didn't have tussock, but it's something that we could probably wear within the production system. Um, so this was probably one of the big questions we had um, at the start of this is, uh, are conservative stocking rates worth it for serrated tussock management? Because uh, I did a survey of farmers um, from, from Mudgee to, to Cooma. Uh, I did a, a survey of about 55 farmers um, when I finished my PhD work back in 2003. And the most uh, common response or a very common response I got was, I can't shut up country because I need to graze it. I can't afford to lock it up. Um, or, or I need to run the animals to make money. So that was, that was a very common theme that came back out of that survey. Um, so um, I, I, I wanted to sort of address that. So if you've got a perennial pasture uh, without serrated tussie, increasing your stocking rate from four DSE to six DSE per, per hectare increases the profitability by 26%. So if you haven't got serrated tussock in the equation, you go from four to six, you're actually making more mo about 26% more money. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but if you've got serrated tussock in the problem and you're using your best bet management, which is spot spraying, then those higher stocking rates are not quite as, as uh, well off. You're, you're down to about 15% better off than, than, um, than uh, running the, the six DSC compared to the four. So there still is some benefit, but not much. So if you move to these really susceptible pastures, um, increase without serrated tussie, increase running from four, uh, moving from four to six DSC, you increase your profitability by about uh, forty percent. So you're really starting to get not a, not a great um, increase. But when you've got serrated tussock in the equation, this those best bet management, which was a spot boom spraying combination. Moving to the highest stocky rate actually had an 80% reduction in profit. So um, my take on it was that in pastures that are vulnerable to serrated tussock invasion, conservative stocking rates are more successful. So it, it pays you not to run uh, as many animals and you, nearly, and, and you can back off and because you'll save on control costs. Yep, and, and so, uh, yeah, I, that's why I think, it, and from our Evergraze work, we found similar levels of, of uh, even in uh, systems without serrated tu uh, tussock, you can bring, your, you, you can bring your, 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 your base use stocking rate back, say, uh, we, we were able to reduce it back, say, from about five and a half back to four, uh, nearly four use a hectare. Uh, and you don't really impact on your profitability that much, uh, or you, you, you don't really impact on it at all because what you, what you miss out on in, in the best years, you make up for in the poor years. So you're actually reducing your risk a bit more. Um, and it's only when you start getting to really low uh, uh, stocking rates that, 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 that you start impacting on production because what you pick up is additional, um, additional production per head. So you're getting higher wool cuts, higher lamb growth rates, uh, which, which are actually uh, contributing to the profitability in your business. Absolutely, it, it's a riskier system. Once you, if you're pushing your stocking rates, it's a riskier system. And once, and, and, ri and once you start bringing something like serrated tussock into the equation, then, then that's where it, it really shows the economics of, of those more conservative. And, and that six DSE was probably really not pushing it in this environment, um, given the, the rainfall that, the, that these areas get, so. Afternoon, so you're available at afternoon tea if anybody has specific questions. Yeah, absolutely. I've been through a lot today, and so if you do want some more information on it, I'd like you feel free to come up and, and have a chat to me. 
Um, if you don't get hold of me today, then um, yeah, uh, you can probably look me up, or I can. I think I've got some cards here I can give you, and you can we can have a chat at a later date. So.